Welcome to the complete collection of Kevin McHale's greatest stories told by NBA players and legends. If you have missed any of the other episodes within the series, there's a playlist link on the top right of your screen and in the description box down below, and if you click on that link, you'll find all the episodes within the series. Comment down below which player you would like to see next, and if you do enjoy these videos, they do take me a long time to edit, so I'd really appreciate all the support. If you do enjoy, please leave a like, let's aim for a thousand likes for the next episode, subscribe if you are new, and hit that notification button so you're notified when a new episode releases. I won't keep you waiting, without further ado, here's the complete collection of Kevin McHale's greatest stories. His creative imagination, his skill set, his footwork, his touch, his shooting, and then his trash talking. It was just absolutely incredible. I mean, with the footwork, the soft touch around the rim, the hook shot, he had it all in his bag. Uh, also, he had long arms. As a matter of fact, if I had his arms, I could shake your hand from sitting in this chair. <laughs> it grew to be 6'10", and when you put that combination together, it was lethal. Low post play, step back, 15-foot jump shot. Charles Barkley said he was the toughest guy he ever had to play in the NBA. The great Charles Barkley was once asked, who was the toughest player he ever had to guard? Who was the guy that you knew you were going to have a, you, you couldn't wait to face? You know, I, I, I will tell you this. I, I never, I hated Kevin McHale because he's the best player I ever played against. Yeah, Charles constantly reminds us who was his toughest competition when it comes, and the answer is always Kevin McHale. Uh, Kevin McHale's the best player I ever played against. My, actually, my personal nemesis is Kevin McHale. I'm telling you, you kids just don't know how good Kevin McHale was. Because he was such, he's the best player I ever played against. You could not stop him. He was one guy who was so much bigger than me with his long arms and his great moves. I had a difficult time guarding him. And then on the other end, he was so long. You know, it, you know, it, it, he was so long. I, it was tough for me to get my shot off if I had to face him up. Six foot ten and blessed with arms so long that people often joked he could tie his shoes without bending over. He had every post move in the book: the jump hook, the up and under, the reverse lay-in, the fade away. Mikhail was simply unstoppable on the block, so much so that in the 1986-87 season, he averaged 26 points a game while shooting 60% from the floor and 80% from the line. You know how many NBA players have averaged 20 or more points, shot 60% from the floor and 80% from the strike in the same season? One, Kevin McHale. And on the other end, I had to use every ounce of energy I did to score on him. That guy, when I, look, when I looked at, because we all look at the schedule, we're like, OK, I can have some fun that night. Uh-oh, uh-oh, better get a good night's sleep that night. I mean, we all say the same thing uh, about different guys. But Kevin McHale is the best player I played against. When we talk about the top power forwards to ever play the game, the same names get mentioned. Duncan, Barkley, Malone, Nowitzki, Garnett. But there's one name that's too often left off the list. The name of a guy who routinely gave some of the greatest to ever lace him up, the business. I, I have no idea why, because he, he wasn't very athletic, but for some reason, he knew all the little tricks, and he drove me crazy when I played <laughs> against him. Like he, like, he kicked my butt more probably than any player that I played against. Well, you probably wanted Bird to guard you, didn't you? Oh, Larry Bird didn't want any of this. <laughs> Come on, brother. Hey, Larry's a, Larry, we, hey, he's Larry Legend, but not on the defensive end. You probably didn't want any piece of that off, you know, with his offense, though. Uh, you know, he was great, great, great. Uh, but like I say, you know, in my day, I mean, it, it was a challenge to play against him. I mean, nobody's going to stop a great player. Yeah. Uh, but listen, I'd rather play against him than Kevin McHale uh, because Kevin was just so much bigger than me with those long guns. And Kevin, to this day, other than Tim Duncan, had the best low post moves of any power forward to ever play the game. Because he was unstoppable offensively and he gave me nightmares on defense. As I was growing up, when we was playing against the Celtics, the Celtics would come in and, you know, they knew they was going to beat us no matter how we start the game. 
in Chicago, the Celts against the Bulls. Kevin McHale, look at this great pass to Robert Parrish. McHale himself had 31 points on the night. He said he was so sure that they were going to beat the Bulls. He said he didn't even bring a change of clothes. They just knew we were going to fold and they were going to come back and beat us. You know, Kevin McHale would, you know, would talk more trash than anybody have ever seen, and Bird as well. But they knew they were going to win. As we go to break, a little trash talking. What did you used to tell people in Game 7? Or in closeout games uh, when they were in uh, uh, I don't Boston. Even want to hear. I used to tell them all the time. I said, "Look at now, when we get done tonight, just shut out the lights, because you know what? This game's over." <laughs> yeah. I said, "When the closeout game, I used to tell Johnny Lucas, I said, John, you know where the lights are in this place? First time, he said, "What for?" I said, "I said because you know, I said right. we're getting ready to shut the lights off on this place." So he told them before the game. I got one of those right <laughs> closeout game. I'm I'm going up. It's about maybe five seconds to go in the game. I go up to shoot. Miguel goes, "I." Right. That is your last shot of the season. <laughs> I hope you make it. <laughs> Some of the greatest feat ever in NBA history, when you're talking about signature moves, Kevin McHale uh, and the dream shake, Hakeem Olajuwon. I think they're the two best. Mm -hmm. two, and I played many years against both of those guys. And Kevin McHale, they got, it got to the point where they were calling him a man of a thousand moves could not guard him one-on-one -on, -one on the box because he had such great footwork and he did a great job of feeling the contact. And once he felt you, you were done. If the double team didn't come right away, forget about it. He had too much stuff on the box. But Man. that's what I love about the league is that no matter what level you're on, when you get to this league, first of all, you're going to be happy that the NBA players are fans of you and they encourage you. The players are and they want you to get better, but you also have to learn everything you know, throw that out the window and get better because guys have different moves that can come. So I tell you, you know, Kevin got this bad reputation as being the black hole and, you know, never passing the ball out. I mean, do you think maybe you guys were a little unfair to him? I mean, you know, maybe you guys were never open. Well, Kevin's philosophy was, why should he pass the ball out when he's shooting 60, 65 percent? Also, Kevin was, they talk about Kevin intelligence on the court. One thing I like about Kevin, he's a very smart player. He never set a pick. The reason why he didn't set a pick, because the guy that came off him had to pass it inside. <laughs> so Kevin knew he was going to get a shot. You know, the one thing about Kevin, and I'm sure you guys will attest to this, I have never seen him at all fail when the game was on the line in the clutch. This guy was cool as a cucumber, a stone of granite. Wouldn't you say, Larry? I mean, he never failed. No question about it. Kevin was so calm. You always hear Kevin talking about... After the game, he goes, he forgets about that game. He goes with his family, which he does. And, you know, that game's history. Let's get on to the next game. But in game two in 1984, uh, we lost the first game. Gerald steals the ball. There's about 20 seconds to go in the game. And Kevin's at the free throw line. We're down by two. And he's so calm. And I just couldn't believe what happened after that. Let's go to it. Uh-oh. <laughs> Let's go to the videotape. I think there's 20 seconds left. Well, there's 30-some, but... Kevin gets fouled and has to go to the free throw line, and he's got two shots. We're down, down by two, and uh, everybody's thinking, well, at least he'll make one and something will happen. But, you know, the players always stand together and say he's going to hit both of them. So here he is. He's getting ready to go line. You can tell right now that he's a little shook up about it because he's looking at somebody else to see if the referee's going to put them on the line. <laughs> so he walks over to their bench, gets his towel. He looks real calm at this point. He walks to the free throw line, and... You know, he's talking, he's having a good time. He knows we're down by two points, and this is probably the biggest game of all of our lives. Cedric comes in, he looks happy. <laughs> See, right now he's seven for eight from the line. He must have got fouled on the one he missed. <laughs> but look, the one thing you gotta watch is his knees. You know, it's so important to go free throw line with a lot of courage and a lot of confidence, but watch Kevin's knees. Don't watch him shoot the free throw. Just focus on his knees. He's calm. He's cool. And he knows he's going to make this. Follow his knees. That was long for the minute it went. Oh, no. <laughs> That was bad. <laughs> Those guys love that, man. Well, you... Casey, here's my buddy Casey. We're playing the next year, and uh, with that, all of a sudden we're having a, um, a film session. Casey goes, I got to show you guys something. He played that about 30 times. I said, come on, man, Casey, you're killing me. <laughs> Gerald, I was talking with Gerald earlier. He mentioned that he wanted me to say thanks for 
uh, making him famous. If you hadn't missed those two free throws in 84, that still wouldn't have mattered. <laughs> You know, once upon a time, Sam Jones had the Celtics franchise record for points in a game. And then Larry Bird eclipsed that. And then Kevin McHale actually eclipsed Larry Bird's franchise scoring record. Kevin McHale, when, before he had the 56, did you look at him as a guy who can absolutely dominate a game? Or was he a guy that was really good, but really you can't count on him to get you a 50-point ball game? Three on two. Kevin got it. McHale's got two. No, yes. All right, spot. Two. Any traffic, too, wasn't it? Finds Kevin. Short. So it's what got him here. Two. And he. Two tackles. McHale. Hale. Two. McHale. Got it. 54 for McHale. And Kevin McHale's coming out. Towards the end of the game, Larry came up to me and said, um, I said, I'm going to come out. It was mid and a half or two minutes ago in the game. Larry said, are well, you crazy? I said, I'm had enough, man. We're, we're ahead. And he goes, if I get that hot, I'm not stopping. Well, nine days later, he got that hot. I said, you stop? And he said, no, I'm not stopping. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you were playing the Hawks, and it was one yes. of those times they were playing some home games down in New Orleans. Yep. And... Uh, I mean, everybody was entertained by this. Even, That's even the guys five. on That's the Atla the, the guys yeah. on the Atlanta they bench. They got five for that. I heard. Yeah. Watch this. Watch they the reactions five. on the Atlanta bench. <laughs> <laughs> you see they got Scotty the Hastings up with there them. Yeah. Here when you get now watch close. watch Cliff Levingston Come on. over here. I think yeah, this is Cliff. Oh. <laughs> yeah, right there. He told me. I, right there. He looked at me. and said, "I told you I wasn't stopping." <laughs> you know, Cedric Maxwell had been playing a lot. Kevin obviously moved into that starting position. Yeah, Kevin McHale was saying, "Yeah, I was right in this corner, and I'm looking at him." score you know it, I guess it was a time when I got hurt and I saw him score 56 points and I'm thinking yeah I need a new damn address right now <laughs> it don't look like I'm gonna be playing no more Kevin with his length with his footwork um, and I mean supreme confidence in his ability not only to knock down the 14 15 footer one dribble to a spot, one dribble to the rim, up and under. He had all of that game. And, and Larry had great confidence in him. I mean, Larry would, would specifically, when we ran the offense, if you threw it to Larry and it was, you know, Larry come off a pin down on Kevin, he wouldn't come off looking to shoot. That's, you, Brian, you know, that's an indication that if you got a guy that's in position to score, you throw him the ball. And that's what Larry did with him. So we knew he was capable of scoring. I didn't see the 56 points coming. I will not tell that to you. You know playing. When you've got a guy that you've got your number one player has confidence in, then you know you got a guy that could play. You know, Kevin McHale is a Hall of Fame player. Compare him to a guy nowadays. It's, it feels like his style of play is like a lost art form now. It is. No, I don't think there's any doubt about it. First of all, you don't see post up. You know, you and I, I see you all the time. Matter of fact, the last time we were talking about it, we saw each other. It was the last game, respectively, that both teams played. Uh, but, no, you don't see Kevin's game anymore um, because guys just – they don't post stop to try to get to position. He just kind of, with that length, just faced you, walked you down, and then he could get it off the block a couple of dribbles and still be able to get himself in position to get a shot that you've had a hard time challenging. You don't see anybody in a game like that today. Two guys who – were great in the low post. And obviously, and one was a mentor to the other, Mikhail being to Garnett. Right. You know, how prevalent will the low post game be in the next five years? We, we, we see all the stretch fours and we talk about it all the time, but here are two guys. The skill was magnificent over the power. So what do you two guys think that's going to happen in the next five years? You know, we kind of talked about you know, the evolution of the post and they're coming from, you know, Wilt and, you know, Elvin Hayes and, um, and that's, you know, just when you think about the post it being a big man, you know, before you had Wilt, Shaq, strong guys being grit, then you see another style of post, um, you know, to Kevin McHale, to Jack Sigmas, to Charles Barkley's, using pump fakes uh, from not just verticals, but at angles, uh, using the backboard, uh, up and unders and stuff like that to really to where you get to, you know, my, my, my class, and we was more uh, face-up shooters, being able to put the ball on the floor, took a, a finesse kind of approach to it. And it kind of really birthed 
you know, myself, Chris Bosch, uh, even Dirk Nowinski, guys, you can, Tim Duncan, you can throw in there that uh, kind of shaped us to what we are. KG in his prime versus McHale in his Ooh. prime. Ooh. Ooh. I'm going to give it to Mac. Mac showed us. Mac is unguardable. Mac had to be double team, triple team. <laughs> You know, he taught me. It's only right. I'm, 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 that's I'm a, a great question. Though, I'm a pay yeah, homage. That's not a great question. They both great, great, but Kevin McHale's great. the best player out of the right. work, Kevin. You can't nice speak because Kevin. you're the best player you right. played oh. against. Don't mean it's not the best player. Kevin McHale, uh, that's not the, oh, look at oh, this oh, the best one. player somebody else played Come on, man. This guy's the best player I've played against. I'm not saying that you... It doesn't mean that Kevin Garnett didn't have all of this. Ooh, all of this, too. Oh, oh goodness. Oh, oh, my goodness. Hard to guard oh, give me that. Give me that. Oh, oh. There you go. Right. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, Take that, we're all right. Oh, Dream right. shake, bro. Yeah. What's he doing, guarding you? Watch out, Irv. Stay out of oh, this business. Oh, oh Big Irv got some of that. Stay out of this business, man. Stay out this business. It's That's not all. as business. clear cut as you think. I, I, ain't no man. Listen, I ain't, I ain't worried about no man who wears skinny jeans. <laughs> <laughs> it always goes back to that. Uh, hey, Chuck, hey, happy New Year. KG. One leg at a time, Chuck. One <laughs> leg at a time. <laughs> and this storied history of tremendous rivalry in professional basketball takes on a new chapter. The Philadelphia 76ers versus the Boston Celtics. He was a tremendous opponent to have, too, with those big square shoulders and, you know, is, is as awkward as he might have seemed sometimes on the court. He always knew where he was going and he knew what he was doing. And he was probably the most feared guy uh, in Boston by the 76ers. Another Boston-Philadelphia classic. I was excited every time we played against you guys, and I loved the challenge of guarding you, but I, I liked guarding you. You get out there, you have this <laughs> wingspan. I might as well just take a jump shot. He's all the way down here. Julius blocked by McHale. You know, I knew if I, if I beat Bird or Maxwell, McHale was going to beat him. Kevin wasn't afraid to, to take a shot at you. You know, he was a, a critical piece to the puzzle, and, and there were many nights when he was the MVP in Boston. Each and every time I walked into Boston Garden, I knew I had to be at my best. People think that you keep these grudges your whole life. Man, we played hard, Doc, and we got after it, and I was doing everything I could to beat you. It was a fierce rivalry, but at the end, like I say, you know, a lot of those old wounds, they kind of fade over. So one night we're, we're playing against the Celtics, and McHale really has it going. And uh, he's, he's torching, you know, our power forwards, you know. Kent Benson. Now, you played with Kent Benson. He was a former number one pick. He's on the Pistons, and McHale is working him. And finally, you know, he started saying he's got these guys in the torture chamber. I know when I talk to my friends that get worked by my current teammates, I lay into them. Were you laying into Kent Benson a little bit? I didn't lay into Kent, because I, I knew it was more than Kent could handle, quite frankly. You have to kind of know your personality. Kent played on our championship team and, and when I was out of college, but he also had Larry had come to visit Indiana University, decided to go to Indiana State. And, and frankly, I'm not sure Kent gave the respect to Larry that Larry deserved when Larry came. Larry always intended to play really well against Kent Benson. And now Kevin's got it. Kevin knows about Larry's intent. And if you know Kevin's personality, like all of us, we all want to be like, love, whatever that's about. He wants to make sure he maintains Larry's respect. So Larry is feeding him the ball so he can give it to Kent Benson. Kent was overmatched. There's just not any question about it. Kevin McHale um, taught me more about basketball, I would say, than, than any big man coach. The way he would move his body, lean, you know, to see it looks like his body is halfway leaned over him, halfway down, but his head is up here. It's just a weird look. So every time they would enter the basketball into him, he would, he would holler, chamber, like, you know, he got him in a torture chamber, and, you know, it's too late. So I was coming back to double team, and he was looking down at me shooting like, you, you, you're too late, I. there's nothing you can do about this. And how he would spin, catch you, make you go up, lean under you, get under you, make you foul. And, you know, once he caught the ball, you were at his mercy. So, the best. Kent was a guy that probably was more of a shooting center than he was playing power forward. At any rate, Kevin went to work on him, and there wasn't a thing Kent could do about it. And I don't, I don't tease Kent about that. I think he, he got enough that day. He doesn't need any more teasing about that.
You know, Kevin is one of those guys who can really get under your skin at times. But when practice sessions were completed, some of the most competitive competition began. Double dribble! Double dribble! No, I didn't dribble! Double dribble! Double dribble! He did too! I didn't. That's all I'm telling you. I think Brian. See, I, don't know, I didn't though. do it. I, it's easy to play when you go like this. No, it was I, 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 I didn't do it. Because <laughs> when I went to get it with this hand, I, this hand came out. Oh, you did, Adi. You double dribbled the ball. No, I didn't. Quick try. I'll let you do something. I'm good. I stole your brain away. You cheated. You cheated. I stole you. Look at this. <laughs> Practical joker, makes fun, real tease. Man, I'm glad when Bill Walton showed up. Because <laughs> Kevin got off my case and couldn't, couldn't wait to get a hold of Bill. Kevin taught me a lot about the game. And uh, one thing in particular is he really taught me how to deal with the media. Just lie. Let the playoffs go on. Ray's tape jobs get tighter and, and tighter. tighter. <laughs> By the last game, your foot is like in a spastic state, but you're really ready to play because it hurts so much you want to kill people. That was one of the reasons I collared Kurt Rambis. My foot hurt so bad, I couldn't help it. <laughs> Kurt, I'm just kidding, babe. Sometimes uh, playing against a person, you, you appreciate them even more. And when, uh, as I traveled and played with a few different teams against Kevin, and we'd go through the scouting report, and we'd walk through what, how we're going to defend him, you know, I'd hear coaches say things like, you know, fake the double team, wait till he puts it on the floor, all the coaching terminology is how you defend him. And I'd always have to step in and say, no, wait a minute. Kevin had this philosophy that if you double teamed him, he thought you could get four points if he scored. <laughs> he used to tell me all the time, I'd say, Kevin, my man is right on you. I'm wide open, my man's guarding you, pass me the ball. He'd say, tell your man to guard you then. <laughs> and I'd go up to him, I'd say, Kevin, mine and DJ's man are both on you. He'd say, then I should get six points for scoring that. He had a great perspective on the game, and I think that all the players that played with him really learned from him to have fun, to compete when it was time to compete, and to deal with adversities. And uh, I appreciate that, and I appreciate Kevin's friendship and the chance to play with him. It'll be, you know, I get, I get picked on all these teams I play with. Now, Dan Marley just came up with a new statistic that he's keeping track of, and it's called SPDs, and it's stories per day. And every one of those stories I'm telling is about the Boston Celtics, and most of them are about Kevin McHale. Thank you very much. I was so lucky to have teammates that I really enjoyed. Bill Walton made that 86 season for me. For a lot of us, you know, Bill Walton was like a guy that we looked at at UCLA, the 21 for 22, the Memphis, just, just some of the stuff he had done in UCLA and the Bruins and, you know, coming in in, in the 77 series in Portland when, you know, the, the, the Trailblazers beat the 76ers. And just some of the stuff he had done, you're like, wow, man, this guy is like a special player. How much does he have left? Um, you know, with Bill's history, we had no clue. Um, we got off to a pretty good start in training camp. Uh, he was pretty healthy. and and we was trying to ride the wave. As special as it was, because being around Bill like that, and actually, I hate to even admit this, I had a picture of Bill on my wall. He was my idol growing up, and I hate to even admit that, but he was, and so playing with my idol was just fantastic. The greatest moment of my life on the basketball court took place at Hellenic College in 1986. Forget the championships, forget the parades. We were practicing, and it was one of the, it was one of the few days that Kevin actually got there on time. Maybe Casey finally got the point of telling Kevin practice started at 9.30 instead of 10.30. And Kevin and I used to love to play one-on-one -on -one before practice. Casey at 10.30 blew the whistle, and we were really going at it at the other end and asked us to come on down, let's get started. Well, we totally ignored him, and we're going at it pretty hot and heavy. A couple minutes later, Casey really blows the whistle and says, okay, get down here right now, we're gonna get started. We're serious. So we drop the ball, we're walking down, and Kevin and I are going at each other pretty good as we're walking down the court. And I'm telling him, you know, Kevin, I'm killing you out here. This is, this is embarrassing. You probably wouldn't even be in the league if you didn't have Larry passing you the ball with all those easy layups. Casey said, okay, I've had enough of this. I've listened to you guys moan and complain and whine and boast all season. 
let's settle this right now. We got the whole team here. Red's here. Red was over there smoking his cigar. But that day, Kevin and I, we decided to have DJ be the ref. Bill's talking trash again. You know, Bill's telling me that. Oh, and by that way, that, that, that game of one-on-one -on -one we had, DJ was the worst referee you've ever seen in your life. He was killing me. I shot for outs. I made it. And I went on and proceeded to kick Kevin McHale's ass all over the court <laughs> and beat him that day. Every, everything I did, he called traveling. I mean, DJ was killing me that day, and Bill did win the game one-on-one, -on -one, but it was uh, under protest to this day. After I hit the game winner in Kevin's face that day, and DJ waved it off, called off the jam, and said, that's it, Bill's the winner. I took the ball out of the net and tossed it to Casey. I said, Casey, practice is over. We're heading to the bar. It's on me. Casey said, right on. Let's go. That's enough. <laughs> Glenn Ordway talked about my induction into the Hall of Fame. I got thousands of phone calls from around the, the country, so many of them from the Celtics, the management, the players and all. None meant more to me though than the phone call from Kevin McHale. Called me up and he said, Bill, congratulations, but you know you never would have made it to the Hall of Fame if you hadn't beaten me that day at Hellenic College. <laughs> and I said to Kevin, Kevin, if I couldn't beat you, I don't belong in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> Kevin McHale. I remember his first practice with Celtics. I thought, well, I'm going to kill this guy today. Because he came in late. Went there about the first two or three times. He blocked my shot. And I thought, you know, I'm going to give this guy a little bit more respect. I mean, it, he actually blocked my shot the first two times I went in there. And I thought, boy, this guy can play defense well. Come to find out, he's a great defensive player, but he's a heck of a lot better scorer. He's the type of guy that you find yourself watching him. You know, what is he going to do next? You know, because, like I said, he, he had so many moves around the basket. And you got to realize Kevin McHale didn't believe in passing the ball back out once he got it. So he's doing these unbelievable moves over two and three people. I don't think you can sum up uh, in any amount of time what it's like being a Celtic. I suppose just an immense pride, uh, willingness to do whatever it takes to win, playing hurt, playing when you didn't feel like it, and playing for the best organization that there's ever been. I mean, it's just, uh, uh, Larry said it best. I think he said if you didn't play for the Celtics, I'm not sure you ever played basketball. And that was the complete collection of Kevin McHale's greatest stories. Let me know which player you would like to see next. Please be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed the video, subscribe if you are new, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Here are two new videos that you may enjoy.